Hello and welcome to our talk on extending CZ HPC to create an AI ML platform. Uh, my name is Owen Cotter and I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Sean Brisbane. Um, I'm my, Sean is a senior HPC consultant and I'm a uh, enterprise architect slash consultant who uh, is interested in HPC and, and works a bit with HPC. Um, and we both work for a company called Secure Links. We had hoped to welcome you all in person to Dublin this year. Dublin is our home city uh, where Secure Links was established and is, is mainly based out of. I'm just going to give a very quick overview of, of who we are and, and what we do. And uh, we will then hand over to Sean, who's going to take us through the main part of our talk. And uh, I'll try and keep this sort of very high level. Um, if you are interested in, in finding out more, please check out our sponsor page on the SuzyCon site. Or um, if you want to take a look at our boss, do these slides, um, the, the intro slides for the cure links. Do, do try do check out our talk on YouTube from last year's SuzyCon. It's tutorial 1195, Solving Hybrid Cloud for High Performance Compute. Um, so just as I said, SecureLynx, based in Dublin City. Um, some of our key partnerships um, would include, of course, being a solution partner for Suzy, but also working with other vendors, including Microsoft, who we partner with around Linux and HPC solutions on Azure. And Dell, who's a, a recent, as my boss would describe, um, re-partner initiative. Dell would have been a partner of ours years ago, but um, but uh, had recently we've become a services partner for Dell again. And we're working with the UK and Ireland team to deliver Dell HPC solutions um, some of them in, in fact, the AI ML uh, space. So primarily we work with our, um, we work in the UK and Irish, in Irish region, but we do also deliver um, projects across the wider EMEA region. Uh, HPC is, has always been a, a big focus area for us since the company was founded in 2002. And um, we, work, we work with uh, both our customers and partners on the design and delivery of HPC systems. So, so, for instance, when we're, we're working with Dell, we, um, we would, they would have a, an off-the-shelf HPC system. Of course, every customer has their own unique requirements, so we'd go in with the Dell sales team and work out what the, the customer needs to tweak in the Dell solution to work for them. We also manage a number of HPCs on-site, both remotely and as part of managed service operations. And, uh, and we also provide es es escalation third level support for customers who uh, who have their own HP, internal HPC teams, but they need a bit of help around infrastructure and application support. And, and we provide that as well. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Sean, who's going to take you through the rest of the talk. Yeah, so the rest of the talk is about the AI and machine learning platform that we've put together on top of um, a base um, HPC system. Um, in this case, we've used this, obviously the SUSE Enterprise Linux for HPC. So just a background uh, to this project uh, is, is probably the first thing I'm going to talk through and then an overview of the components and how it all fits together. And then we'll have a technical run through, um, both um, in detail technical slides and then there's a demonstration uh, that we recorded as well for you to see um, this working um, in practice. And then of course there'll be time for summary and um, our question and answer session of course will be online and I'll be available on um, Wednesday the 10th of June, uh, Thursday the 11th, and the following Tuesday. So our background to this, um, so as, as Owen said, we have uh, many years experience working with HPC customers in that space, and we're on a journey with them to uh, learn about and to um, move into the artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science area. Um, so there's a lot of synergies between the, certainly the hardware and the methodologies that are available in HPC and AI. Um, and our primary goal really is to bring um, that hardware up to date to work with um, HPC. Sorry, so bring that hardware along uh, to work with HPC and AI platforms on top. So our base, as we said, is the ultra-stable SUSE Enterprise Linux for high-performance computing, which gives us all that support for GPU and CPU nodes and the interconnect and everything else that goes with HPC, um, as well as having su support and available images on the cloud. Um, our, our cloud of choice would be Azure at the moment, given our partnerships. Um, there's no reason that AWS or Google, um, Google Compute Engine 
uh, wouldn't be a supported ap application if that's uh, where somebody wanted to take this. Um, so that's the base. On top of that, we layer um, what we are calling the AI stack, um, primarily for batch training, uh, but also for AI inference type applications. So the visible part of this would be the Jupyter Notebooks application, which is really becoming, I think, quite rapidly the de facto standard in industry, um, the de facto way to develop, certainly for data science. Um, it's a very graphical interface and allows you to save um, all of your work and present, basically double as a present, presentation engine as well. Um, we've chosen Python as the language here to, to talk about in detail and demonstrate, but that also works with Julia and R. Um, so that's the top level. Uh, underneath is a platform that's fully integrated with a standard set of these Python AI applications, such as TensorFlow. Um, the whole premise throughout is that users can run an entire uh, AI workflow entirely from the web. Um, we're looking at having bringing on board users who may not be familiar with Linux, unfortunately, um, uh, despite how much they might be missing out in that case. But um, it's it's the case is that we want to bring people um, up to speed and able to do AI applications without learning more than this absolutely necessary um, to run their workloads. And we retain all of that scalability um, from the underlying uh, HPC base and the accelerator support. Hybrid cloud bursting is also possible um, with a secure link hybrid cloud for HPC. This was an add-on to Slurm that Owen talked about in SUSECon 2019. So we see this stack really as a boarding ramp to AI. So we've talked really, we'll talk through basically bringing um, existing HPC customers uh, clusters, people familiar, people with those skills and familiarity with HPC. Um, and all of that skills is reusable and all of that hardware is reusable. And on top of that, we just place the application stack and the familiar graphical environments that uh, new or existing users would need to move across into this AI machine learning data science space. So we're really trying to reduce the barrier entry there and focus on people with AI and not Linux skills. Um, for existing HPC experts who might be uh, moving across into the AI machine learning, we would provide, so they'll be familiar with Linux potentially, mostly, um, but we've made sure to include an out-of-the-box working AI stack of software as well. Um, through, throughout all of this, the development process we've leveraged entirely throughout uh, community building blocks, so free, free or open source if possible, or otherwise free um, software. Um, so we're looking, we've included NVIDIA containers, we've used co the Conda project, Jupyter Notebooks again is free open source. Um, and uh, as well as what we've included, um, we've tried to, we, we have supported the in inclusion of additional user created applications that again come from all of these building blocks that are available on the, on the internet. So we do a small, a small amount of work to create a platform, um, but we support a number of a vast number of applications through that, um, as long as they work with Conda, Jupyter, um, or Singularity. So to run through, to run through our use cases, um, our main use case there is to build this AI and machine learning technology alongside a traditional HPC customer. So we're looking at people, primarily even still, who are running uh, an on-prem cluster and maybe having a small to medium sort of cloud workload and maybe a, a small add-on for AI on top of it. But they see that AI stack growing and becoming more dominant perhaps in the, in the near to, to medium future. We're looking at um, targeting people who rapidly on board, uh, want to rapidly on board new AI machine learning users. So that might be new students in a university sector. It might be HPC familiar, familiar people in the oil and gas sector who are moving across to do more data analysis. Um, they may have various experiences, but it may not be in the AI and machine learning space. Um, and we wanted to make, make sure we can handhold them essentially as much as possible with this platform. Um, probably Slightly more important in AI machine learning is the GP, level of GPU support versus, sorry, versus HPC. So we've made, the platform is fully supporting of, of GPUs. Um, and 
to ensure that wide choice of open source software um, while maintaining a stable base. So we see this, uh, there's a few other uh, similar technology, uh, similar stacks out there from different vendors. Um, it's not unusual to see a Jupyter Hub based stack, um, but with our choice of open source and uh, high, high value uh, that's inherent with, with using SUSE underneath, I think this could be a low cost and flexible option versus the market. Um, and again, to leverage either new technologies quickly um, or to uh, take advantage of the cloud economics through bursting, there's a there's a um, cloud connector that can dynamically allocate virtual machines up in the cloud. So to go in a bit more detail uh, on the solution, we've chosen, uh, basically the, we, we were faced, when we were looking at this, we were faced with maybe the choice between two engines that sit to sit underneath that were kind of on the face, perhaps roughly equivalent, but we weren't sure, let's say we weren't initially sure which way to go. Um, the choice there was between Batch and Kubernetes. Um, so we were seeing really the workloads more around, alongside the AI training were what people were looking at when we were initially scoping this. Um, so AI training is probably more suited to batch workloads. Um, uh, a batch system versus Kubernetes would be better for a resource constrained system. So on-prem, let's say, um, because of the way that batch scheduling works and allows you to um, queue and wait for resources to be available, you can tend to keep things more full. Again, that drives value. Um, allows you to run these workloads and share alongside traditional HPC, given that there was, that was the main target audience. Um, and again, um, coupled with the existing skills, and skills, there's no need to scale up to use the Kubernetes. I'd say as Kubernetes um, has, it has its own merits um, as well. Um, potentially that they're more scalable, although we've addressed the scaling uh, last year um, with batch systems in uh, SUSECon talk. Um, and I think Kubernetes is, would be really good if you're looking at real-time systems. So that would be, say, ingesting data um, from the Internet of Things and providing, uh, say, an AI inference engine on top. So we've kind of focused on the training or batch inference. Um, we're not really geared towards the, um, the, the real-time inference. Um, but I think this is a good low cost solution for certainly for universities to um, bring it, bring people into into AI. So as an overview of the solution, uh, so the, sort of towards the right and the bottom there, you've got a, a diagram of your traditional HPC, um, a head node running Slurm. Um, underneath that, uh, one or many uh, traditional HPC compute nodes, their hardware, uh, but also the ability to burst into the public cloud. Uh, so Azure is what we'll demonstrate, uh, and private cloud too, if, if you so wish. Um, throw all of this, certainly through the public cloud, we're looking at um, the, the option is there to dynamically allocate those resources on demand. And then, so on top of this traditional HPC base that we've talked about there, is just a Jupyter web node, um, which is fairly lightweight resource that can run also on the head node, if your head node is uh, reasonably well specced. Um, and this is the interface that the users will see. Um, this is what they log into. This is how they configure batch jobs, um, AI batch jobs. This is how they configure their application. And this is how they also have their Jupyter notebooks presented through. So that all, that all as far as the user is con concerned, everything is available from that single pane of glass. Um, so we've talked about um, traditional and cloud support. Um, people can talk through advantage and disadvantage of, of, of both types of clusters. So we've taken a, a hybrid HPC approach. So the advantage is there, um, we've made sure that's a single stack, a uh, single environment across the cloud and on-premise, so that whatever works on one system um, can more or less be, almost certainly be taken between the two systems. Um, and that allows you to do, take advantage of both things. So for the cloud, some of the real advantages there are the rapid deployment of new GPUs and accelerators, uh, which means people can prototype uh, and experiment with new systems um, without having to take investment uh, in the HPC. And then when they, when perhaps they find an, a, a particular GPU or accelerator that really works for their workloads, then there's opportunities there to purchase those, bring them on-prem if that's an economical way of doing it. And exactly the same environment will work across both systems. Um, and of course, you've got the on-premise cluster where 
a lot of the time, if you can keep an on-premise cluster full, it's much more economical than uh, using the cloud nodes. Um, yeah, so that gives you the ability to prove new technologies and in the cloud and also to burst to the cloud um, if your workload is uh, irregular. So that puts a couple of requirements on the stack. Um, if we're trying to support these new hardware and accelerators, we need to be able to move quickly on the software front as well. So um, given, <laughs> I think it's difficult um, for anyone really to maintain uh, absolute fully tested um, applications uh, for, for AI as, as and when they come out. It takes a time to really mature those and, and build them into something like Suzy Enterprise Linux or um, any of the other platforms that are out there. So we've really, and, and we've seen this kind of in the field with our consultancy work that um, quite quickly, you can provide a core, of, a base core of very good quality, high, high quality tested applications, which we do do, but also people want to be able to bring in the new, say the newest version of TensorFlow, et cetera, very quickly as well. So we wanted to keep our platform very customizable so that people can bring in these applications. And we've given a set of tooling to, to support that. So versus what else is out there, as, as Owen has said quite extensively, we, we do work with Dell on a very similar platform. They use bright technology, um, Bright Cluster Manager and Bright AI add-on for that. Um, so what we have here is very similar, um, lower cost, but similar. Another thing that's similar out there is, is IBM Spectrum Conductor, Conductor. And we've seen a lot of deployments in this across Ireland, um, sorry, of the Delbra AI bundle across Ireland. So if this is a real demand out there, um, to really onboard uh, new groups into the AI space uh, that we see in these little little mini clusters um, being deployed in a number of places. Um, and some of the main requirements we have around that are, as well as deployment are to customize that for those new applications as I've discussed. So to get a bit more technical now, I'll, I'll run through a the proof of concept architecture and the look and feel of the graphical interface. Um, talk a bit through scheduling workloads, although we're going into a lot more detail on that on the demonstration, and then uh, some details around which the, the choice of components we've used to build this up. Uh, and then I'll go into the roadmap. So as the user logs in, this is the web interface that they're presented with. It's a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a Jupyter Hub based uh, web interface. We've taken a lot from Jupyter Hub for this. And we can spawn a number of different servers. Um, so you can start one server uh, or many servers, depending on if you want to run multiple jobs at once or you want to try out different technologies uh, or scales of job. So each one of these servers is ultimately a batch job running on a Slurm cluster, um, on, a sl on a node on a Slurm cluster. Um, each of these is, can be a different application running and it can be a different set of hardware. Um, so regardless of whether you pick one of these named servers, I'll just click start start my server um, to, get, to, get in, to get in really quickly. You're presented with this form next. Um, so where you can customize your node type, which we build in. So each, each type of machine, whether it's a batch, uh, traditional batch CPU node or it's a cloud dynamically allocated GPU node, they're all linked to Slurm partitions. Um, but all the user needs to know about is the type of machine that they run. Um, which is named appropriately in the GUI, so say head node, cloud GPU node, etc. Um, so that's how you select the machine. The next thing is you select the application. So this is the environment under which it runs. So either that's a environment module or LMOD, um, or it's a Conda environment in, into which the application is, is, is spawned, or it's a singularity container uh, with support for that particular application. So this example is just uh, TensorFlow for 1.4. Would be the application environment under which the Jupyter notebook run ultimately runs on the back end. This is completely separate from the core application, so you can so the core application stays stable and robust, and the users can add their own applications, which may need some level of testing. It won't crash the core application. Um, there's a bit more mileage for power users as well if they want to further customize the environment settings in this box. So. What's happening then is when, so when the user 
pick spawn at the end of this this only form that they need to kind of fill in uh, to customize their job. Sloan will go away then and um, allocate a batch job according to their requirements, uh, which will then either run on a traditional HPC node or um, it will support it will run on a public cloud node. So with our securing hybrid cloud for HPC add-on as well, we can also dynamically allocate those cloud nodes. The only kind of fixed footprint there that is necessary is the head node itself and the Jupyter web node. Again, they can be on the same machine. Um, everything else potentially can be dynamic, either dynamically allocating a job from an existing pool of traditional HPC or completely dynamic in the sense that um, it's allocating a VM completely out of the ether in the cloud. So I talked about this the stable core and then the, the user applications. So in the stable core, SUSE HPC, a Jupyter Hub web-based platform, uh, a user-ready set of standard AI applications, um, and then the applications tooling as well. So the tooling to add new applications would be in our stable core. And then the glue, the SLX spawner for accelerated notebooks. This is the thing that connects your Jupyter Hub system to the batch queues and allows you to build the uh, to spawn these Jupyter Hub backend instances onto a batch queue. And of course, NVIDIA CUDA as well for GPU support. And then the user ready stack. So this is the, the list of, let's call them core applications uh, that are ready tested with the system. Um, so this is a, a bunch of common Python AI applications and we've tested that with against CUDA environments, uh, sorry, Conda environments with CUDA libraries. So that supports running on natively on the system itself. And then we've took, we've wanted to use containers as well. The AI ecosystem is absolutely filled with different uh, available containers that are freely available, let's say, on the web. Um, so we need to be able to support that. We've used Singularity given our the batch system kind of inheritance of this platform. So a Singularity container um, we've included with TensorFlow, NumPy, Scikit-Learn, Metpolib. So these are the so we've got Conda environments out of the box, we've got Singularity kind of out of the box, uh, and both of those trial applications, let's say, um, ha have support for this, this list of standard Python applications. Uh, in the demonstration, I show you TensorFlow. Again, so in a bit more detail, we wanted, we really wanted to focus on allowing users of the system to bring in their own applications um, and have them integrated with this graphical framework. So we added some tooling as well to do that. Uh, an app creates script, which is pretty much the only time you need to open a Linux command line um, as a user, um, is to uh, bring in an application that you've got from somewhere that supports JupyterHub. So that's kind of up to the user at that point. And so you support Jupyter Notebooks only. Um, so that's up to the user at that point. Um, and then that could be a singularity container, it can be a Conda environment, environment, or it could just be uh, basically through environment modules or even just um, the system itself. Um, so you have that application uh, from somewhere um, and then the app create tooling does the necessary to add that into the graphical interface. Um, and But again, keeps that application away from the, the stable core. Um, so the tasks there are installing new Python kernels into the core application, uh, setting up the new environment modules file, um, if, necessary, if that's appropriate, or otherwise adding a singularity container path, and then adding the application as a drop-down list in the, in the spawner list. Um, so our container support comes through singularity. Uh, so where the scheduling is done onto a fixed resource, um, and we want the lifetime of the container to be mapped. The lifetime of the job singularity is much more appropriate than Docker. This scheduling is performed by Slurm. Um, what we've used uh, two projects, which we'll go into detail a little bit more on, and I think the next slide uh, from NVIDIA, NVIDIA Container Images and HPC Container Maker, which are NVIDIA Container Images would be how you support uh, GPUs in containers and HPC Container Maker is then how you build those HPC and AI applications on top of the existing images. We found these to be useful projects for um, managing singularity containers. And then 
so you've got the option of building from these projects, which we recommend are a good way to get containers, or to, as I say, leverage any open application development that's happening elsewhere. So freely available singularity images on the web are easy to add to portal. And most Docker images, the ones that don't use network and user namespaces, would be uh, appropriate to convert to singularity images and, uh, and use as well. Yeah, so these these useful projects I want to kind of high, give a shout out or highlight too because I thought they were they're very good. Um, not my work, but not entirely my work anyway. Um, so the NVIDIA container images, um, basically they support uh, the creation of a basic uh, image, uh, container image um, on Linux with uh, CUDA built in. Um, so we had, so we had, NVIDIA had support for Red Hat and Ubuntu, and we just added a small amount to allow this to work with SUSE containers. Uh, so we can now build NVIDIA uh, CUDA enabled uh, SUSE containers through the NVIDIA container image project. Um, the second one is HPC container made, very similarly supported Ubuntu and Red Hat. So we added the SUSE images, SUSE guest um, uh, uh, mechanism there. And that allows you, there's a whole, a whole range of HPC software, either built from source, um, built through Python and pip, uh, or built through Anaconda. And we've, the demonstration that we give um, has a Anaconda environment inside a NVIDIA HPC container maker built singularity image. So there were, but these are fairly widely used projects enough. Um, and the robustness here comes from community reuse and version pinning. Um, so once you have a, a working environment, pin those versions of the code, and, uh, and then you have a reliable container. So we've mentioned Conda a few times. Um, I found this to be a very useful tool set for building these AI applications. Um, it's uh, essentially it's it's a, a way to distribute binary code um, in a way that takes care of dependencies. Um, unlike, I guess, uh, your OS style, uh, like say Zipper. Um, it has multiple flexible versions, um, so it does a quite a detailed dependency resolution graph. Um, but also, unlike the OS, uh, this particular set of versions may not be well tested together. Um, and so, whilst there's a lot more flexibility there, a particular stack does need some validation that it works exactly for you. So it's not like just installing a Slez RPM, you do need to test that a lot more. Um, this taps a huge and diverse ecosystem. The machine learning community is heavily invested in Conda. Um, um, and so there's a lot of work there. So if you can support Conda, we have access to a wealth of new applications that way. Um, so at this point, I will hand over to uh, a demonstration of the work that we've done. And I'll show you all in action running on Microsoft Azure, dynamically allocating GPU nodes from the cloud. Hello, and welcome to our demonstration of our web portal for data science, machine learning, and AI applications. It's based around Jupyter Hub, which is a very, very popular development uh, environment um, for data scientists these days. Um, what we've done is to extend uh, what's a great application, uh, web-based uh, application, to run on traditional high-performance computing clusters to take advantage of the resources and skills and investment in hardware that may have happened on those on those systems. The idea really is to bring the HPC world and the AI world together. We think they're very similar uh, in the way that they need to allocate and use resources sensibly and uh, maintain a, a high degree of utilization. There are differences, however. So they, I'd say the AI and machine learning and data science worlds um, make heavier use of containers. There's a distribution, uh, software distribution, um, that's used heavily called Anaconda, which allows for Python, R, and Julia language-based uh, libraries to be uh, imported and distributed in a sort of well-coordinated way. The Probably the, the main thing is the, the graphical interface, the, the heavy use of, of notebooks as well. And in terms of hardware, I'd say we're moving to a world generally in 
and AI is probably just the first of many to really move the computing um, from CPUs towards GPUs, these hardware to, and accelerators generally. And these accelerator technologies are moving more and more, more quickly. We'd say that it's useful to be able to trial applications on the cloud using these accelerators. And perhaps as well, it's worth noting that sometimes the developments there move faster than the traditional three or five year hardware refresh cycle of HPC. So perhaps it's worth running all the code in the cloud continuously and to take advantage of the new hardware as it comes online. So we'll show you cloud bursting uh, to the cloud. With that in mind, we've assumed that perhaps most of the CPU workloads can be run on traditional HPC that you have in-house, and maybe the GPU workloads are being outsourced to the cloud. So in our example here, we have a head node, which is also running Slurm and the Jupyter Web UI, and a cluster of CPU machines, in this case, just one. Um, we've run these in Azure, just as an example. These could be running on-prem. Our dynamic resources are all going to be allocated from Azure exclusively. When we log in with the first thing the user is presented with is the spawner. Um, this allows you to set up both the application environment and the type of system on which you want the notebook to run. So we're mapping system types to Slurm queues and our dynamic cloud nodes are also a separate Slurm queue just for the simplicity and ease of use. Select a few parameters like how long the job's going to be, how many CPUs you want, how many nodes and GPUs you want, and then the application environment under which it runs. So we've got two examples here. One TensorFlow GPU, where we've used the Anaconda distribution to get our packages and libraries together. And one Singularity environment, where we've used NVIDIA Container Maker, um, the NVIDIA Containers project, and HPC Container Maker to build those containers um, to have TensorFlow integrated. You don't need to use those technologies. Um, anything that works with a Singularity container and environment modules can be imported into this as long as it supports Jupyter Hub. And even Docker containers can be converted to Singularity containers for the most part. Singularity is really the, the te container technology that optimized for HPC, which is why we've gone with that. So we're going to use one of our existing CPU nodes now to spawn a Jupyter Hub notebook environment. So what's happened there is we've allocate, we've submitted a batch job to the Slurm queue that's gone away and it's allocated a node on the, the default partition, default queue, um, and then it's just dropped us into the user's home directory graphically. And I've got some demonstration notebooks to show you. So what we have right here is a, typ a typical notebook application where we import a lot of Python libraries, and then we'll run some code and just start it off. Uh, what we're actually running here is a neural network, a convolution neural network to distinguish between different pictures and to categorize them into different groups. So we have the CIFAR um, data set here of um, photographs of 10 different things, which are split into a test group of 50,000 images a training group of 50,000 images and a test group of 10,000 images. You can see they look a bit like this. Um, this is the first 25 images in, of that group. We're going to set up the convolution algorithm in the next frames and then train that on the first 50,000 images using TensorFlow version 1.14. So this is running on a CPU node um, and it takes, there are 10 epochs of the training and it takes about uh, 90 seconds for each epoch to run on our traditional CPU machine. Um, if we leave that running, that's allocated from our CPU queue. If we leave that running and start a new job now from the control panel on our Jupyter Hub, we can add a number of servers. So the, each one of these is a different batch job that runs. I'm gonna give it a name, GPU. Uh, and this time I'm gonna run a cloud GPU node. So there's no GPU nodes running in Azure at the moment. Cloud GPU node, we ran TensorFlow GPU. Um, we also have a Singularity instance installed. I'll run it in the Singularity instance um, just for a change. And I'll get one GPU on the Azure GPU node, still running with one CPU core and spawn that. Now this time 
similar thing again, it's submitted a certain job this time to the GPU queue, but there's no available GPU resources on the cluster. So what, what happens now is the SecureLink's hybrid cloud plugin for HPC kicks in, which we talked about in SUSECon 2019. This is going to go away now and allocate a new GPU node from the Azure pool in the cloud. That takes a few minutes uh, to allocate and to, to spin up. The GUI will pause while it waits for the node to start. If I refresh now, it's built, it's, it's allocated the virtual machine and now it's creating it. So that's going to take a few minutes just to give all the right OS settings to the machine and boot it up. And very shortly, um, so that's running, that means the OS is booted. The final settings are being configured and Jupyter starting and will be redirected then to the user's home directory where we can start new applications. And we're presented with a very similar thing to what we were presented with on the CPU node, got the same thing. So in here, we've got a few more um, ready to go Python notebooks, um, all identical to the previous one. Um, just to avoid running the same thing on multiple instances all at once. Import our modules, set up the convolution search algorithm, convolution neural network algorithm, and start training on 50,000 samples again. So just to jump back to the CPU job, we're still running. We've done um, about four minutes of training and we we're in epoch number four. Um, on the GPU job, we're doing an epoch every 20 seconds. Um, in fact, it speeds up through here. So this is actually going to overtake the CPU job, which means we can cloudburst when it suits us to take advantage of new applications and sorry, new accelerator technologies and when CPU might actually be far too slow and costly. So in this case, we're using Singularity containers built through the NVIDIA containers project and then customized using HPC Container Maker, which is also NVIDIA. The work we've done on that is to adapt the existing tool set by NVIDIA to work with SUSE. Um, previously, it only worked for Ubuntu and CentOS. So we can now build SUSE Leap containers um, using the HPC Container Maker. So we finished training the model and we can finish and we can make a few predictions based on that model. So we're going to use a few of our, the first few test images. So here we have the first three test images, a cat, a ship and two ships. Um, so our algorithm uh, is, has predicted it's a cat and it was a cat for, and a ship. And so it's got it right for the first two instances. It's predicted this one to be an airplane, which is actually a ship. So it's got it wrong in the, foot, the, the third instance. Um, so typically for these machine learning algorithms, you want to run on larger and larger training sets. So in our little example, um, while our, whilst our CPU system is still running, um, it's probably going to finish in 15 minutes, not a big deal. But if we needed to train on millions of samples, the GPU thing is clearly the only way to go in, uh, in a sensible time frame. So it's good to be able to cloud burst. So the next thing I'm going to show you, um, again, as I say, the machine learning AI space moves quickly and it's important to be able to import and use new applications, techniques, or even just version updates to libraries. So there's no set list of applications in this portal that, 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 we, that it works with. All we really have done is to provide the portal and an interface so that anything that can run Jupyter notebooks will be able to be integrated with this portal. On top of that, we've also added helper scripts to make sure that the most common ways to build an application on HPC in the, in the HPC and AI space are well supported and easy to use with this portal. So somehow we have built an application. Either it's been deployed through Anaconda uh, which I'll show you in this case, which is a really easy way to install ready-built machine learning software. This is what we've done for TensorFlow. It's a few simple commands. Or we've downloaded or built a container either through the NVIDIA HPC Container Makers, uh, HPC Containers Project, or just found a ready-to-go ready Docker application from the internet that works, and we've converted it to a singularity image. So somehow we've got those applications, 
the ecosystem out there has a whole number of application sources that we just need to be able to download and use. There's very little need to, to rebuild everything yourself these days. But the final thing that's supported is, of course, standard environment modules. So we need to import this application that's installed. Uh, it's an upgrade to TensorFlow, to TensorFlow 2.1. And we were running TensorFlow 1.14 before. We just give it give our app create a few parameters um, to, to tell it where the application is installed, where we might want to install an environment module for that application so that people can use a terminal um, to spawn out batch jobs if they wish, uh, and give it a name um, to appear in our GUI. This is the app create script. This works for Conda, and it works for Singularity, and it's probably the trivial example as it also works for environment modules too. So we've now just run that, that little command there that's added the environment module for Conda and pointed to the relevant version of the software and integrated it into our graphical interface. So now when we go back to our control panel, I'm going to stop this GPU server just to free up the resource. Uh, GPU 2.1. We can run on our new application, TensorFlow 2.1, which is running in a Conda environment. The SecureLinks hybrid cloud for HPC is configured to leave uh, allocated nodes running for five minutes in this, this demo. So that GPU, even though it had no workload, didn't deallocate itself straight away. It would take five minutes. And now if we run um, the same benchmark and print out the TensorFlow version, it was, this is the old, the old run through. It was running at 1.14. Uh, um, if we just run that cell now, We've installed an upgraded version of TensorFlow, and we're now running our new instance of our notebook in a different environment. Voila. As I say, we can do that also with Singularity containers as well. So that's it, really. Um, we've run a graphical interface, a graphical web-based interface for machine learning and AI on top of a traditional HPC system. We've shown you uh, how to cloud burst with the SecureLinks hybrid cloud for HPC, uh, which you might want to do to take advantage of um, either to scale up for bursty workloads or to take advantage of new uh, and new hardware accelerators that might be coming on stream. And I've shown you how to integrate, how it's easy to integrate applications built through traditional HPC methods and also through the methods that are very common and well used within the AI and machine learning space, that is, that being containers and Anaconda. Yeah, and so I hope you've enjoyed the demo and uh, we'll look through our presentation as well. So our roadmap um, for this is, we're very much consultancy driven, but we see um, certainly that the Jupyter Hub um, is slowly going to be replaced in the community, we think, with the Jupyter Lab system, which is a much more full featured graphical interface than Jupyter Hub. Um, one of the things that I think we miss from Jupyter Hub is the ability to open a batch terminal in place. So Jupyter Lab will batch terminal in place. So Jupyter Lab will have that functionality and then many other widgets to help with graphical tooling uh, and adding new new graphically enabled applications, all from that one, again from that one pane of glass. So that just pushes the need to open a SSH session away a little bit more for a little towards the more and more power user. Um, and it's prettier as well. Um, to look at the SUSE NVIDIA container integration. So at the moment, it's just in our development branch, the work we've done with uh, HPC Container Maker. Um, I'd like to talk to NVIDIA about upstreaming that. But everything we do is consultancy led. So we can look potentially someone who would like to run this on AWS to support more batch systems other than Slurm or Talk add more default applications and language that we test. Um, and um, on the SUSE front as well, it would, what there are are standard AI applications available in SUSE Enterprise Linux, uh, sorry, sorry, in the community um, repositories for SUSE Enterprise Linux, but um, there's none in the sort of supported base in SUSE. Um, it might be nice to see a few of those going in, um, but there are community uh, tools for that already. So in summary um, of our current state, we su would support SUSE, of course, and we also Red Hat and CentOS. Uh, 
the clouds we spot at the moment would just be Azure and native, um, and uh, we can run in containers as well. Um, so anything that supports containers. Uh, Slam or Slam with bursting talk without bursting module, and then all of that orchestration, build and scripts uh, done. So in summary, what we've presented is a web-based portal for easy onboarding into the AI world. Uh, we've used batch system base so that we can maintain compatibility for people who've got existing HPC, and this just layers on top. It's scalable and burstable so that we can use cloud economics and take advantage of new hardware. Um, and to ensure that this is ready to go um, out of the box, there's a number of standard training and inference applications that we've included by default through Conda. Thank you very much.